I think we're all okay to go. <laughs> so it's precisely 1445. So welcome to this session. Um, it's going to be very, very informal. Uh, you've got a, an, an international uh, group of experts who have all agreed what they're going to say. They're just going to say yes and going to agree. <laughs> and there'll be no discussion. <laughs> So, but, but we've, we've got people from all around Europe. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have some very, very stimulating discussion with this. They're all dead worried because they've no idea what I've got up here. And they know how unpredictable I am. <laughs> but I can assure you, they're all going to be relatively simple, straightforward cases. Perhaps cases that you would see from day to day, but you'll have the opportunity of seeing how other people think about them and how they deal with them. And then there are one or two that are not quite so simple. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's the surprise. <laughs> All right, so. So first patient. It's a 25-year-old woman um, uh, with a unilateral nasal obstruction. They're all going to have a history like that, aren't they? They're all going to have a, a nasal obstruction. So it's a right-sided block with a bit of facial pressure. Um, the pressure's relieved when her nose discharges. She had a, a history of rhinosinusitis three years ago. And the only thing that is wrong with her, apart from that, is that she's got Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome type 2. So she's a bit bendy and stretchy. <laughs> All right, so that is the endoscopic picture. So pale, smooth polyp. Uh, you can see it in the right side of the nose. But when you look in the left side, you can see it across in the nasopharynx. All right, so Sergey, what would you assume that would be? Diagnostically, no, no diagnosis without CT in this case. Oh, it oh, of course. needs a CT three scan. Dimensional. Very it's wise. Con Antracranial polyp. So there's the oh. CT scan. Okay, so so what what do you think of that CT scan? It's antracranial polyp. Antracranial polyp. Cyst in maxillary sinus and huge yeah. polyp protruding from maxilla to the yeah. pharynx. Yeah. Um, and it, it's got or all the maybe all the features. some rare pathology. Some rare pathology. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Reda, how would you deal with that? I just want to make sure that uh, whether it is uh, antroquinal polyp or not. You see, so the first step is to uh, try to uh, configure the consistency of the of the uh, uh, unilateral nasal swelling. But you see, it looks like the antroquinal polyp, but the other possibilities are, are there. If I'm convinced that this is an antroquinal polyp, yeah. I, I would proceed immediately for a transcendental endoscopic uh, approach. Okay, right, so how would you do it? I, I usually, it's, it's, I don't want to say easy, but it's one of the, the, the best operations done by uh, uh, the first comers or the early uh, comers, because you see, we, we can proceed to the uh, polyp and they use a, lo a lot of decongestant and decongestant and decongestant. Yeah. Why? To decongest the intrasinus part and try to hold the neck of the of the uh, polyp and try to deliver it posteriorly. And in a lot of cases, we succeed to get the whole stuff in one uh, uh, piece. The cystic part hand in hand with the fibrous, fibrous part. The yeah. intramaxillary cystic part with the nasal and nasopharyngeal uh, fibrous uh, parts. If yeah. We fail to do that. We can just go to the to the neck and cut it into two pieces. Deliver yeah. the big part of the nose either via the nasal nostril or if it is too huge, via yeah. the oral cavity, and then proceed to the intra nasal part. The most important part of this procedure is to make sure that we achieved the yeah. attachment of the polyp or the site of origin of the polyp, whether it is in the lateral wall or sometimes in the medial wall. And if we have, an, uh, in, in most of cases, it is getting out, not through the natural ostium, it's getting out through the 
uh, the uh, accessory ostium, we have yeah. to communicate both. But th so this is based on, the, this is an anticoagulant polyp. Yeah, so there's no catch with it. It is if an anticoagulant polyp. He was, if it he was is. suspicious of me then. Did you see that? <laughs> if it is. <laughs> but if I suspect it, I have to yeah. rush for uh, definitely yeah. MRI before I do any biopsy. So you do an MRI? If, if I'm suspecting, so I have to go to the consistency right. of the okay. All right. the, 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 so, the score. Okay. Tim, what would you do? I'll come up. Well, the um, radiologic uh, uh, picture is quite typical. So you mm. can see the round contour of the um, uh, cystic part of it. And uh, the picture, uh, especially in the nasal pharynx, is also typical. So I wouldn't do much more than what you already said. Um, I would start with the mid, uh, middle meatal entrostomy, mm -hmm. which I would expand as needed. Uh, you can always do even a medial maxillectomy uh, mm -hmm. if you need to. If you, yeah. What I, I usually do, um, I do not usually send frozen sections in this case. If I find something suspicious, I just expand the operation and make it a middle maxillectomy. Okay. Sergey, you wanted to come in again. Uh, septal deviation on the same side also proves it's anticoronal polyp. Maybe rare yeah. tumor, but usually typical uh, picture of anticoronal polyp. And of course, during endoscopy, it's necessary to touch it. Is it movable or not? Yeah, yeah. It's easy to change position, find it, neck. It moves it's, and it's the set. Yeah, and the, you're absolutely right. The septum was over, which limited access and made it technically a little more difficult. Okay, and any hints on how to prevent them coming back? Hans Rudy? Well, you must go for the root of the polyp. You must yes. find yeah. where it originates. And when you clear this area, then I think the chance is highest that it will not recur. Yeah. So yeah. go for the route. Don't trust go for the way, but take the route out, and uh, this would be the best solution. Leave the inferior turbinate alone. Um, <coughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, you, you have. To, it, it's sometimes not that easy to find the route. You know, the whole maxillary sinus is blocked. Yeah. And you have to come uh, from the polyp, so it's not easy to identify. Maybe it shrinks a little bit when you manipulate this polyp, but you have to go for the route and you need to be clear where it originates from. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it, it looks like a anthrocranial polyp, but it's a bit polylobulated, which is mm -hmm. probably not that characteristic, although it looks like a... Yeah, it's definitely an anthrocranial polyp. Yeah. So, it's, so it's not a trap? No, it's not a trap. <laughs> okay. They, like, they're still <laughs> suspicious of me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, that's just some more pictures of it. And the last question, I think we've exhausted the management of it, um, but the Erlus Danlos too. I follow, Stefan. I follow uh, remark. Uh, there was a, a teeth, a teeth which is expanding a little bit in the sinus. Yes. And I would be a little bit suspicious about the dead angle you have with the prelacrimal recess. Yeah. And in that case, I would do a combined approach, like a middle medial antrostomy, classically. Yeah. But I also would make an inferior medial antrostomy. Okay. Because I had some cases of recurrent disease, like four or five years later. And through that inferior approach, I could take it away just like this. It is just a small procedure, but I could control the dead mm. angle of the anterior lacrimal side. And I can check also if there's nothing wrong with the tooth which is extending into the sinus. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's quite a good move. Sometimes you just need that dual access yeah. to, to, to get at them properly. Yeah. And you yeah. can go, I completely agree, you have to go also yes. to, to search for detachment. Yeah. Because on the first operation five years before, I certainly have missed, have missed the attachment. Yeah, okay. I'm not going to put anyone on the spot with this, but is the Earlis Danlos of <coughs> any relevance? The Earlis Danlos. Earlis Danlos, Danlos type 2. Well, 
it's quite a rare disease. And yes. I, yeah. as far as I know, there is no interaction between anthrocornale polyps and Ehlers Danlos. No, there's no association between the two. Um, but, you, but you can have anesthetic difficulties with it. Yeah. Or bleeding um, tendency. For the bleeding, yeah. for the uh, respiratory problem? Uh, you don't get respiratory, but it, uh, you can dislocate the jaw uh, yeah. during yeah. intubation. Um, you can have problems yeah. some, with, with some of the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes uh, with local anesthesia. So if you inject local anesthesia, it's often not very effective. The theory behind that is, is that it, they get previous soft tissue bruising and then they, they don't get dispersion of the anesthetic solution. But it, it's something just to bear in mind for anyone having an anesthetic. Good point. Okay, so let's move on to something completely different. Um, this is a, a man who presented with nosebleeds, uh, only 49 years young. Um, and that is the appearance. It is the best endoscopic picture I could get. Uh, difficult to photograph because it's in the anterior part of the nose. So you get the vibrissi getting in the way. And then they get on the lens. And, and the room's not completely dark. But can you see that clearly enough? Ludovic, can you see that all right? Yes, it's okay. Yeah. So what, what do you think... That is presented with a bit of nasal obstruction it, and nosebleed. Is it possible to have the CT scan? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to know yes. by touching. I because would like to know by touching yes. if there is an attachment on the yes. septum or on lateral side. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that's exactly what I did when I saw him, uh, and it's arising from the septum. Okay, in German. Okay. So angioma, yeah. possibility. Angioma, yeah. Angioma, Fericus, angioma. Fericus, Fericus, yes. Angioma. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fericus angioma. Um, the diagnosis, um, well, for, uh, the histology came back, and it was consistent with what we call the pyogenic granuloma. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The pyogenic granuloma is a big misnomer because it's not infective. And it's not a granuloma, <laughs> but we call it a biogenic granuloma. So what would you do with it? Remove. I remove. Yeah. For endoscopic approach. Mm. So techniques of removing it? Approach. Laser. <laughs> laser? <laughs> Transoptic. Okay. Injection, <laughs> injection and not? laser it or? Yeah. Elevation of mucosa and mm. laser step by yeah. step removal. Yes. Or you can just elevate <laughs> mucosa and cut it out. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, often the pedicle is not so wide. It's very uh, uh, Cecil pedicle. Sorry, yeah. is it? Often the pedicle is not wide. Mm -hmm. not no, that's large. absolutely yes. right. Yes. The, the, it it the looks as if it's covering the, that side the of the pedicle nasal is often mucosa, very, the septal very mucosa, but small. the, the yeah. base was yeah. really quite small. Indeed. So but even yeah, if you, you cut can, away the you mucosa underneath, you mucosa end up yeah, with yeah. really a, a very limited yeah. raw area and it heals quickly. Coagulating ah. loop, also nice. Coagulation, yeah. Loop. And a loop, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways of taking those out. Mm. Yeah. In, in our experience usually in these cases to make sure that where is the attachment. If it is from the septum, yes. M m many cases are basically capillary hemangioma, but this yes. is what is. Uh, anyhow, the most important part of the story is to decongest and decongest uh, the, because usually if you touch it, it whatsoever a tool, yeah. even bipolar, whatsoever bleeding. So after decongestion, we inject the yeah. septum meticulously. Yeah. So we usually the uh, hemangioma dies, dies, and the, and the, well, usually we yeah. cut the mucopericondrium around and remove uh, the mass with the one centimeter mucoperichondria around uh, in total. So usually no bleeding. Yeah. So usually good handling and good preparation render the operation very easy. Yeah. But if you begin with the, with the yeah. lesion yeah. itself, yeah. And go through uh, yeah. a lot of bleeding yeah. and you may suffer a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And there is an association uh, in women with pregnancy as well with these. 
experience. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. No shaver. Uh, so I didn't do a scan. We we just excised it, um, and I think we've exhausted the no. other comments on that. So the next one, another patient with nosebleeds. So right-sided nosebleeds. Um, he worked with plastic. He was a windows fabricator, um, and. I hope you can see that clearly now. There are lots of, of little bumps in his nose and he's got this main lesion here. Okay, so Sergei, would you like to start again with this? What, what do you think that is? It's like fungiform papilloma. Papilloma. Yeah. 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 Or inverted papilloma. Yeah. You, you'd always... <laughs> Mainly Consider, it, is it an exophytic or is it inverted? The thing is that this has multiple, yeah, multiple. little yeah. um, satellite lesions. The aspect is... And you'd expect it to be exophytic. Yeah. Mm. But histologically, it came back as inverted. Okay. Yeah. Um, which was a surprise. So, what would you do? Would you biopsy it or excise it or... Go on biopsy before, the, CT? Biopsy CT before the surgery CT is possible, CT but uh, you CT scan? The, yeah. the aspect so is I typical little, yeah, and it's like. possible to do a frozen section. Yeah. A frozen section? Why not? CT. Uh, you, CT. It's a possibility. Yes, but I think CT the frozen section depends before. where you work. Um, we, it, in, in our unit in Liverpool, they've now rationalised pathology services and that means they've closed all pathology in all of the hospitals and moved it centrally mm. um, and now you, you can't get a frozen section at all yes. ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's progress. Yes, yeah. it's regression. <laughs> so, what about sinuses? Is it intact? Sinuses, is sinuses intact? are absolutely intact. fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Laser removal. So laser removal. Okay, Rada, what would you like yes. to do, say, to, to a lesion up here? Vaporization. No. Oh. No, 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 no. Interstitial thermotherapy. So, uh, ablation, uh, ablation yeah. or excise, <laughs> excision? Biopsy before. Interstitial. Biopsy before. A biopsy? Uh, yeah, before. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah. the bad part of the story is that it is unilateral yes. and bleeding. Uh, yeah. Well, papilloma usually is bleeding is rare. Yes. So, so bleeding in such a papillary mass, I have to put yeah. the possibility of associated yeah. uh, carcinoma. Yeah. So the, the biopsy uh, after, after CT and MRI definitely should right. be considered and uh, meticulously uh, uh, covering the possibility of any associated malignancy because mm. of the bleeding. Yeah, okay. I think that for the audience, it's important to do, I think, it's my opinion, a biopsy. Because uh, yeah. if we are in a session concerning the bleeding tumor, it's possible to, uh, to be um, uh, epidermoid carcinoma. Yes. Why not? Yeah. Okay. You're absolutely right that, that having a history of bleeding just puts yeah. the stakes up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you want to biopsy that before yeah. you do anything else. Oh, yeah. The biopsy confirmed the diagnosis of inverted papilloma, but okay. it looks simple to excise that, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it's no, just no, no, no. looking at you, but no, no. is it? No, no. it you, sa you said the sinuses Sin were clear. Sinuses are yeah. okay, yeah. No CT, no I available? Uh, I haven't got one available, no. It would have made the discussion too long. Yeah. <laughs> I've got some more cases to get through. Good excuse. Enough. Good excuse, yeah. <laughs> but is, you, you see something like that, it looks dead easy, doesn't it? But it, is it? If it's not Could there be a problem with that? If it's too high, it's not so easy. If it's an olfactory cleft. It's right up in that nasal valve area. Yeah. Yeah. Ste yes, Stefan, how would you... How I do think, you that? I think for the audience you should know that you, there is also a medical legal aspect. Yeah. And if you try to, to cut in and you miss a carcinoma, yeah. your, no, your name is going around your city like this. Yeah. So I, I think I, I would have, like it has been told, I would like to have... It's all right, don't, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> we, we've biopsied it. <laughs> I, I, I would like to add um, an MRI. 
In MRI? Fact, bec yes, okay. because this is the uh, only one exam uh, yeah. able to mm. uh, to do the the extensions, precisely extension of yeah. the uh, pedicle of attachment of this yeah. lesion. And yeah. secondly, because when you have inverted papilloma, it's possible to have two sites of inverted yes. papilloma. Yeah. So it's very important to do also a CT scan and a MRI before the operation, in my yeah. opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay. Well, it, right, sure. inverted papillomas, we are in a round table on benign tumors. Yes. But in fact, they are, or they're, they may be beasts. It's a mm, severe yeah. disease, maybe not in this case, but uh, you need yeah. to remove them completely. They have a chance of about 10% of getting malignant, yeah. and so it's, it's not that easy, straightforward, so no. you need to So you've got to excise it completely to try and control the disease, and in a site like that, you've got the, the real possibility of inducing scar tissue formation, adhesions, and nasal stenosis. You need yeah. at least 15 minutes to take this out. <laughs> <laughs> Swiss minutes, yeah. <laughs> he always works in Swiss time. Okay. Um, the next one. 68-year-old man, unilateral polyp and a nosebleed. So he had a bit of a, a watery eye as well and some tenderness over the cheek. Um, retired painter and decorator, uh, and he, he smoked but not heavily. Um, a history of having recent dental extraction adjacent to that to the left side of the, the nose. Um, he'd been in hospital a month before with a heavy nosebleed, okay. and when he was in hospital, they found out his platelets were low, so the hematologists were investigating him. So that's what you could see in the nose. This, uh, this is the left side of the nose, the nasal septum lateral wall, and there was this nice smooth polyp filling the left side of the nose. Um, so Ludovic, what, would you like to start on this one? Sorry, who? Yes, but um, it's um, more difficult for this case. So, um, unilateral he, polyp. He, he suffered from a dental sinusitis before. He's. Yeah. Is it uh, is it suffered from dental, dental sinusitis? Dental retraction. Uh, no. no, no, it's a new symptom. What's the reason to remove the teeth? Oh, caries. Caries. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Only. Only. It was not a dent. <laughs> Without it issue was, in it, sinus. Uh, it was a distractor because the dental um, extraction was, or the dental infection that he had was not related to his sinus disease. No. So I, I think it's difficult to do a biopsy in office because uh, he suffered from thrombocytopenia. Yes. Yes, so it's yeah. difficult. Um, so it's tempting to look at that and think just biopsy it, but mm. the platelets no. Uh, no. make it dangerous. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I'm going to start the exploration with the uh, yeah. CT scan and MRI. Okay. Yeah. All right. I would, I would, just like you did, I would try to move it a little bit to see where the attachment is. Yes. To see if it comes from cranial or yeah. it's coming from lateral, just okay. to have an idea, without, without scratching it, but at yeah. least to, have, yeah. to know if there is a connection to the skull base. And I did that, and it was coming from the middle meatus. Okay, that's good information. Yeah. yeah. All right, so this is the scan, um, and we have CT and we have MR on this occasion, so... Um, Hans Rudy, would you like? You're yes. probably easiest to see that. Would you like to to talk us through these? Well, not easy to see in this light, is it? <laughs> well, the differential diagnosis is quite wide, but one, yeah. on one of the first ranks would be a neuroma or anything like that. May maybe some yeah. Okay. Well, associated tumor. Yeah, and uh, it seems to come from the floor of the orbit. 
I yeah, don't know. you've got something here, haven't you? It seems to be yeah. quite solid. Yeah, yeah. And we are on a panel on benign tumors once more, so it must be. A <laughs> he keeps tumor. reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it, yeah. it, it may be a neuroma, but the di All right. differential diagnosis is quite wide. Okay, so he had a biopsy, yeah. and it came back as inflammatory tissue. Okay, fibroma maybe. No, just inflammatory tissue. What's this? Um, polyp. Well, polyp, yeah. <laughs> inflammatory polyp. Could be a mixed tumor. But it could be a mixed tumor. A mixed in tumor. Inflammatory. Okay. Lymphoma. So, D during a biopsy, there was uh, a lot of bleeding or no bleeding? During the, 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 the biopsy. Uh, not a lot of bleeding, but he was brought in and the, um, and the, the platelets were managed. Mm -hmm. Was so, he immunosuppressive patient? No. 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 What was the nature of the biopsy? Did you take a little snippet? Or is this a bit? Right. Everything? Yes, of course. All right. So the, the initial yes. one the initial yeah. one was relatively small and it came back as ah, inflammatory ah, yes. polyp. Okay. So yeah. and then it was no biopsy. We went on and did a, so. sub, a more substantial biopsy. Okay. And we need to I do didn't, another one. Yeah. I did, well, let me explain. Uh. Let me explain, because <laughs> the next bit is a bit unpredictable. But I didn't do the second biopsy. Yeah. Um, and that was, but it was a much bigger biopsy. I talked to the surgeon who did it, and it came back as an inflammatory polyp again. Does no. uh, is it doesn't possible? look like this on the uh, T2, though. No, no. So I was worried about this, and I arranged for him to come in urgently, but I couldn't do it myself. And I saw him when I came back to work three months later, because <laughs> it... it, it you can never time your own problems with medical problems, and I had to go for surgery myself. So I came back, and the first clinic I did, I saw my friend, the man with the polyp, and it looked the same as it did when I went off for my operation. I thought, oh my God, you know, there's this great big inflammatory polyp. No one's looked after him. And I went through the histology, and I thought, this is bizarre because it's come back mm. twice as an inflammatory polyp. I do not believe it. Mm. So just to speed things up, I got him in very urgently and I did it myself. And sure enough, there were two polyps together. There was the inflammatory polyp in front, in the front oh part God. of the nose and the polyp behind it that wasn't quite so inflammatory. And Sergey, you, I was trying not to, to let people hear you because you got the diagnosis right, but you're not allowed to do that <laughs> today. So he had, um, he developed the shooting pains in the eye, um, pulsatile polypoid mass, uh, resection of the mass, platelet management, and histologically, mm. oh, a plasmablastic mm. lymphoma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So the whole point of this That'd is nice, use yeah. your sixth sense. If you don't think it's a benign polyp, then chase it until you're completely sure, because this was a benign polyp hiding the real pathology. Mm. The MRI was quite not... When you go back to the MRI, I mean, yes, the T2 sequence, yeah, was you not, can see two different polyps. polyps. You Happy can see two different pathologies there. And the interesting thing was that that really wasn't pointed out on the report. Um, so I think it was missed on several occasions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but okay. it just shows that you've got to got to keep your wits about you and you can never, even though these things might look benign, you can never trust them. <coughs> okay, so. Uh -huh. And next case. 52 year old man, um, he didn't have any nasal symptoms, um, but he did have a scan. The scan was because he, he was a little on the heavy side um, he was hypopituitary, uh, and 
as part of investigation of that, he had an MRI scan and it showed a lesion in his nose. His only other history was a fracture when he was a child, fractured skull. Um, and he has this, this is in the left olfactory cleft, and he's got a, a red mass up there. Um, and if I can get this to play, um, Played? No, it's not going to. Okay, well, just go. But, but you can see something very similar on the other side of the nose, at the superior part of the septum, both sides. Um, so, Stefan, can, what do you think that is? You, I, I would have done just like you do move it a little bit. Move see, it. see, it comes from the, the roof, yeah. and you think about the cranial, uh, cranial fracture he had, yeah. and you think immediately about something coming out of the brain. Yeah. So, uh, no biopsy. All right. So, you, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a bit red as well. <laughs> so, okay, no biopsy. See if it's coming out of the intracranial cavity. So, see if there's a connection. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, and you like to see scans. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's the scan. So the skull base is intact. Um, so okay, any any comments on those? Scan the oncocytic papilloma. Oncocytic area. Possible. Too much blood. Too much blood, yeah. Blood supply is more yep. active than in oncology. Okay. Well, I'd like to see T2 MRI. MRI, yes. And, and pe more scans. Yeah. <laughs> more scans. And I, know. I know it's not fair because he can't see the whole range of scans, but there's, a, there's the MRI. It's a T2. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Angiography. Yeah. So. It's highlighting. Yeah. It pulsates. It's red. And it's on both sides of the nasal Angiogra septum. Angiography. Angiography. Indicated. Well, you could do an angiogram. Yeah. yeah. Yes, maybe an yes, angiogram. I didn't on this occasion, but you could certainly go on to yeah. do angiography. Um, and the next step with that. We did do a biopsy a in theatre under, uh, under controlled situation, and it was a hemangiopericytoma. Oh my God! So the, they are rarities, but they, they can arise from the skull base and cause defects in the skull base. So, Andrudi, how would you manage that? Well, I'm not completely sure whether they are completely benign. Mm -hmm. And so... This is benign. Yeah, well, this is benign. <laughs> but, but, but we have... <laughs> we, ha we have learned before that even though we have a benign yeah. workshop, it may be not benign. And, and, and these lesions may be, um, mm. may be also malignant or may have a tendency. And so I think we have to mm. go for complete resection or yes. zero resection of this tumor. Okay, all right, mm. right. So Stefan, how would you resect that? Well, at first sight, I would, I would think maybe I cauterize the, um, just at the smallest part and take the whole thing to the, mm -hmm. uh, to the lab. And uh, by cauterization, I don't think I take too much risk. Okay. So it's cautery, rather? I, I believe in such a case, uh, and we are sure that the skull base is uh, intact, and it's a benign uh, panel. Is it, it's benign. So, <laughs> so, so, so sub usually you begin uh, uh, one centimeter before the lesion, inject, 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 and then dissect the tumor from the, the septum, 
yes. bilaterally from the skull base bilaterally and yeah. go and the, uh, define exactly on, on site whether mm. the immediate term, terminates are involved or not. The, the yeah. most important part of the story is to make sure that we remove the whole stuff. We did the whole job with a safety margin because the possibility of recurrence is very high. Yes. And this are, legions are very aggressive. Yeah, so you do. You need a good clearance and a very thorough clearance, and the best chance of that is getting a wide exposure of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I did do it endoscopically. Would you do a spina palatine artery ligation if it bleeds? Yes. yes. Or would you do it before it bleeds? No, I would not. No. 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 I would not. No. Would you? No. 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 All right? No. Uh, we can't easily go back to the scan, but, well, let me flip it past. Um, um, but if you look, it's, it's extending back here into sphenoid. So I did open yes. up the sphenoid. Yes, I think it's yeah. um, necessary to open the sphenoid. The, the, the sphenoid the left, as if it were it's the left a one. collection, not tumor. The, the sphenoid, is it a collection or tumor? Yeah. That you see to, in yeah. It, it was uh, it was tumor extending back there, but yeah. not arising from it. Yeah. So it had gone through the anterior wall of sphenoid and pushed into the sphenoid, but it didn't arise in from the sphenoid. Yeah. So it was it was a wide excision making a superior window in the mm. septum mm -hmm. to get access from mm -hmm. both yes. sides and cleaning it off the skull base. But I agree, you should take yeah. a wide margin around it. Yes. I agree. Yes. Even on the septum, because normally there's more on the septum. You have yeah. to go around, otherwise you can get it uh, like recurrent disease. If yeah. you don't go wide enough, I agree. Yeah. So, uh, I have a yes, so, yeah. Uh, did you build the skull base? No. Yes. Well, very with a diamond, but just I uh, polished the area. It's yeah. Question. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that's important? Yeah, because we face a lot of imaginary cytomas. They are very aggressive tumors. Mm -hmm. So we do what is called the sequence. Do you want to use this? No, it's okay. I think I'm on. All right. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. We do what's called sequential layer resection for this, and uh, we go one step higher than the uh, particular place involved. If the skull base is involved, we drill the skull base till the dura. The dura is involved, we resect the dura because the hemangioperistoma is very notorious for recurrence. And yeah. sometimes I have had patients, I have operated three times, four times, I have resected the dura, it's gone. And then we also sometimes give radiotherapy for this patient if it recurs after three times, four times. Yeah. It's been yeah. described in literature also that, you know, they give mm -hmm. radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I bet you see much bigger ones than anyone else as well. Yeah. yeah. It's huge. Yeah. How long should you follow a patient up with that problem? Ludovic. <laughs> well, well, they have um, a high level of uh, chance of recurrence. So yes. you should follow them on, on real long term. Mm -hmm. Yes. More than so five years. At, at so least. If you get to five yeah. years and no years recurrence post-surgery. Yes. Do you think you need to keep following them up after that? I would follow them up like a tumor patient, long term, at least five years. Uh huh. Would everyone agree? I think so. Yes, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Right. Each no six dissenters. months. No? All right. I, I think the most important thing is for uh, to take a regular uh, MRI uh, every. Uh, year or so, yeah. uh, till at least five years, so that we don't have a recurrence later. So yeah. I think yeah, maybe as uh, Professor uh, uh, Rudolph says that it's, it's uh, tumor free, the MRI says tumor free after five years, maybe then you can... Mm -hmm. But, but you can see the whole area very easily with an endoscope. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So would you do an MR still? The, 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 the problem is that the, the scar tissue forming after the surgery. Yes. The scar tissue forming. Sometimes there can be hidden tumor there inside. So okay. we found one case where the whole thing, once you resect this, abuse what's cobulation, a lot of cobulation there. Yes. There's a lot of scar tissue there. Underneath that, you can have some tumor there left yeah. behind. So you never know. 
All right, right. Okay, well, well, that's hearing it from the experts. But it's one of these things is really, really rare uh, in the UK. So when we do see them, they're usually relatively small. Right. Okay, next case, a 41-year-old, uh, three years, severe nasal obstruction. Um, he had complete obstruction of the left side of the nose. Um, this is the tumor. So it, it was smooth, it was pale, he had blood vessels on the surface of it. Um, He'd had no symptoms from his nose before this developed, um, and he was otherwise very, very fit and healthy and well. Uh, who'd like to start? History of head trauma? No history of head trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and, <laughs> And Hans Rudy, it's benign. <laughs> it's, a benign. Yeah. it's a benign tumor. It's a benign tumor. <laughs> He's right again. <laughs> History of previous surgery. What no, no previous surgery. No. Well, it can so. be everything benign. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> the surface is smooth. Yes. But so, you have yeah. again a wide differential diagnosis, and so yeah. you need you need imaging. So you need imaging. Yeah. How long? How long were the uh, the complaints? Three years. Three years. Three years. Three years. Three years. Yeah. Three years yeah. But but the other side of the nose was absolutely normal. So slow. This can slow be benign, down. but something behind. <laughs> <laughs> it's behind you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. So, here we got the scans. Um, so, looks a bit more impressive on the scans than it does endoscopically. So, Stefan, come round and have a look. And Yo, so lesion in wide the school base. Yeah. You have some uh, uh, calcification inside and yeah. around. Yes. Um, around here, yes, yeah, and you on, can see it going upwards here into the anterior cranial fossa. Yeah, on MRI, you have a height uh, enhancement by the yes. gadolinium Just here, yeah, and like you that. have a sp um, not typically not typical, but um, um, a specific attachment on the dura mater. It it possible. Yeah. Uh, it's not invading it can, Jura. Yes, it can be a meningioma, mm. a factory meningioma. Yeah, well, it, 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 you've got to think of that in the differential diagnosis. Yeah. Um, we know it, it, it's benign, so that rules yeah. out an olfactory neuroblastoma, Hans Rudy. <laughs> no, <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so. He had a biopsy. Yeah. Um, and the biopsy came back as a neurofibroma. <laughs> it's gone into the sphenoid and it's eroded the sphenoid roof. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, was, uh, it was quite a fun one to, to take out. Mm. So it was a neurofibroma. Um, and I did it jointly with the neurosurgeon, um, excised the whole thing endonasally, and, and then repaired the defect over the dura with fasciolata. Um, and he's been absolutely clear since. Yeah, they do yeah. very well. That's yeah. the patient. The morphology is the same. And the final pathology was the same, yes. 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 The patient so no, su no surprises. With other manifestations of neurofibromas? Any other neurofibromas? No in other yes. neurofibromas? No. no. It was my question, yeah. No, mm. just a single neurofibroma, yeah. 
And how even long in the post-op? How, how long post-op? post-op? Uh, we've got to two years now. Yeah. The, the Dura was resected? Yes. Yeah. We took, well, we didn't include Dura. We, we excised it off Dura. There's a plane between the neurofibroma and the Dura. I had a case like yeah. this and I had a recurrence one year later coming out of a locus in the Dura. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, I think you need a high index of suspicion yeah. of recurrence. Yeah. Yeah. And because of that, I think that is when we need to have recurrent MRI scans yeah. of, uh, for surveillance. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But um, anyway, the, so not all of these nasal polyps are as easy and straightforward as, as you think. And you get the surprise every now and then. Right. 68-year-old, uh, 10-year year. Year history of nasal obstruction. Now, it's a very long time to have a blocked-up yeah. nose and not to go to your doctor with it. Um, he'd had a nasal injury, assaulted six years <coughs> ago. Um, history of purulent discharge, nasal pain, headaches. So some sinusitis there as well. Also had COPD and severe asthma and non-steroidal hypersensitivity. So you start to think of a CRS with polyps. Um, no effect from topical steroids. And when he had an endoscopy, then that's what I saw, a pale polyp just filling one side of the nose. That's the right side of the nose. And it seemed to be arising from up in the olfactory cleft. So, I'm a bit not quite as extensive as I was expecting to see. And there was no sign of infection there either. Mm -hmm. So, what would you do next with that? Next with CT. CT scan. CT scan. Yeah. Make sure you haven't got anything coming down from the anterior fossa. Do a biopsy? Not before the CT scan. Not before the CT scan. All right. Yeah. So we scan first. Yeah, sure. Yeah. One would think about a hamartoma yes. from localization. You think it was a hamartoma? No, we'd, we'd think about that. It's yeah. a diagnostic uh, tool. Uh, yeah. We'll go in that direction. Okay. Respect well, we'll keep that one in mind. So there's the scan. The anterior so, cuts of the CT. Do I have more cuts? Any anterior cut, yes. Because this um, is... Skull base intact. It seems to come from the sphenoid. I just see like this. Yeah, got some more cuts there. Skull base was intact. Yeah. Intact anteriorly as well. And intact anteriorly. Yeah. Find neck and cold instrument removal. So... This can be... Salivatory gland tumor. So salivary gland tumor. Could be so. Possible. They are rare, but they do occur. Yeah. Hamartoma, another option. Um, you've got a bit of mucosal thickening showing up in that maxillary antrum. Um, but not very exciting in terms of sinus pathology. And you can see the polyp here in that, that mm -hmm. gray area there in the nasal cavity. So. The sagittal attachment, biopsy. where was it attached? Biopsy. It's a good point, because it was, it was attached to the septum superiorly oh, yeah. in the olfactory cleft. Yeah. yeah. So, it can be biopsy also. or excise? Yeah. Both. Both. To both. <laughs> well, <laughs> the well is the, because it's a narrow base, yeah. so it's very, very easy to do an excision biopsy. It was consistent. It was fluid. It was firm, and it wasn't wasn't fluid. No, it was firm. Yes, it can um, be also an inverted papilloma. Inverted papilloma. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
And that's what it looked like. And this yes. little notch here yeah. was the septum digging into the posterior wall of it. Oh my. And who'd like to know the histology? <laughs> and you're going to be so impressed. Now you know why they're experts. Because yeah. it came yes. back <laughs> as a respiratory epithelial adenoid hamartoma, this, this long new definition that they've um, called it, the rear. Until the professor of pathology had a look at the scans and it came back as an inverted papilloma. <laughs> <laughs> so, so everybody was right. <laughs> um, but, but it's a nice case because it, it was excised completely, it's not got a problem. Yeah. Um, but, but the respiratory epithelial adenomatoid hamartoma is, is now becoming more well known. Uh, we, I heard yesterday that they're more common if, if you tell the pathologist this is what it might be. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the power of suggestion, isn't it? <laughs> But has, have people seen many of them? No? They are quite often bilateral, and uh -huh. the diagnosis is a problem. So yeah. you need to think of it. And if you have bilateral mm -hmm. polyps coming from the olfactory cleft, which is unusual in a yeah. polypoid inflammatory case, mm -hmm. you yeah. have to be suspicious and you have to tell the pathologist. Yes. You will not get the diagnosis if you just send the polyp and right nasal polyposis, yes. probably. So you need to have uh, an awareness or a level of suspicion for that. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, you, you're absolutely right. But it came back as a bit of a surprise. And what I found was interesting was that the, path uh, the original pathologist had said to me, uh, he's written in his report, that you have to treat these as if it's a low-grade adenocarcinoma oh, and that really cancer. surprised me because that was up your surveillance to a different category and I talked to the we've got a very eminent professor of pathology in Liverpool and I talked to him about it and he said don't believe that at all that's nonsense and he just dismissed it so there is controversy in the pathological world about these things mm -hmm. It's, it's funny that you, you often think that the pathologist just can get things perfectly right all the time and it's very black and white. And it, no. it, it, it just isn't like that at all once you get mm. to talk to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think overall they probably do have a very difficult job. Uh, and we've just got to make it a bit more stimulating for them. So, next case, 57 year old, six month history of an obstructed nose. Um, he had what looked like left sided ptosis uh, and one of my trainees had actually sent him off to a neurologist mm -hmm. who thought that he had myasthenia gravis and started doing lots of tests on him but that was uh, thrown in as a, as a potential option. However, he had a soft swelling above the left eye. Unfortunately, I haven't got a photograph of that, but the soft swelling of the left eye made the left eyelid look a bit droopy, and I just thought he'd got a swollen eye, not myasthenia gravis. Um, so... <laughs> So the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis was, uh, was just not, it wasn't correct. But you've got a soft swelling, you've got a blocked nose, swelling bilateral on the same side. And Bi bilateral obstruction. And nose. Uh, yes, bilateral, bilateral obstruction. But he had endoscopically a huge polyp in the left nasal cavity. I don't have any pictures because we've, we've had a couple of times where people have wiped the hard disks in the hospital and taken all the images off. Um, so 
Um, but he had a huge inflammatory looking polyp in the left nasal cavity. Um, and I knew you'd want to see a scan, so I put the scan up straight away. So, um, who would like to, to explain this scan, describe the scan? Tim, can you have a go at describing that? Yes, it's so, uh, yes, we have uh, unilateral obstruction in the nose. Yep. And um, there is a uh, total opacity of the frontal sinus. Yes. With uh, some erosion of the um, lamina papyracea on the superior uh, orbital rim as expected because you said about the swelling. Yeah. So you've got a defect there. Yeah. 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 Um, and some osteitis is inside the frontal sinus also. I can see on the left picture. Yeah. I. I altered the contrast on this, and it's, it's, it's just not showing up. But in a dark room, you can see the opacity in that sinus dropping down into the left eye. Yeah. Yeah. So it's pushing the uh, the or, uh, the eyeball inferiorly. So you've got a massive polyp, left side of nose, erosion here. Uh, displaced left eye. So, w what's the next step with that? that that's the, the skull base there is intact, but, the, but you'd be suspicious that there'd be something there. Yeah. MRI? And trauma before? Yeah. So, uh, trauma as a child, but it wasn't relevant. So this is the MRI. Um, so you've got changes here in the frontal sinus. Uh, you can see the polypoid lesion here. It's in continuity with the frontal sinus up here. Um, and you've got mucosal thickening of that left maxillary antrum. Yes. And the protrusion so, into the orbit is uh, inflammatory. Yeah. The protrusion into the orbit and is inflammatory. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All so, live movements were normal. Yeah. Do you so, have a T2 or T2 sequence? Because yes. there, when there is an, uh, a black hole, yeah. uh, it could mm. be fungal. It could be fungal. If, if there is a T2, there is a, like uh, no signal, no central signal. That's right. Yes. yes. Then you the sign yeah, of I MRI change of it. within the frontal sinus. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. And on T2, we, ha we haven't any signal yeah. in the middle yeah. part of the yeah. frontal no. sinus. So, so I can't show you that. Um, but fungal sinusitis yes. is, is a very good suggestion. Yeah. 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 Or inverted yeah. papilloma. It remembers. Or an inverted it papilloma. Looks a bit like a papilloma. Yeah. So what would you do? I'm going to start a course for two weeks with oral steroids. Okay. And antibiotics, and see if there is a rapid changement yeah. in uh, in in the symptoms. Yeah. Would anyone else support that? What type of uh, fungal you are suspecting? What type of fungal? Is it invasive or non-invasive? Well, it's not fungus, but... It's exactly. But, but, you know, would you give systemic prednisolone and, and antibiotics I, I would not. in review? I would give antibiotics if I had orbital cellulitis or yeah. acute symptoms. Mm. But if I didn't have acute symptoms, I wouldn't give antibiotics. I would okay. go straight to the yeah. operation. Well, it's a unilateral polyp. And yeah. It's unusual. Of course, yeah. it can be fungal, but you need to clear the diagnosis. Yeah. So you need to go for a biopsy. You need to know what it is before, yeah. before you treat. Of course, okay. you can try, but uh, maybe... Yeah. It's worth to go for a biopsy. I agree with both of you. It's, uh, 
it's a, sometimes a useful ploy when you've got these difficult pathologies that you could have inflammatory polyposis in addition to other pathology. Um, and actually treating that medically with steroids and antibiotics and seeing if it changes mm -hmm. can sometimes make a difference. Mm -hmm. But the priority, I think, is also to get a biopsy because we don't know the pathology. We don't understand the pathology. Yeah. Um, so he had, that's what I did, I did a biopsy in the outpatient clinic and it was the same pathologist I think, it was inconclusive, inflammatory polyp, <laughs> again. <laughs> But how much so well, it was, it was I took, a, a I took small... A, I, I'm so used to <laughs> the pathologist writing inflammatory polyp, I take sleepy <laughs> biopsies now. The thing is, in it, the M MRI, it looks <laughs> as we have a mass high up, yes. either in the uh, superior ethmoids or the yeah. frontal recess or frontal uh, sinus itself. Mm. So I would not expect a simple biopsy in the clinic to be of any help. I would go straight to theatre. Okay. Is there an advantage to doing a biopsy in the outpatient clinic? Well, sometimes you may have a conclusive diagnosis. Not always. Yeah. But if you have one, then it's much more easy to have a good concept for further treatment. Then you can yeah. do the plan. So it's worth to try it. If it's inconclusive, then you have to go to the next step. Yeah. I would suggest one thing. On clinics, did you have uh, secretions? Because I would take secretions as well uh -huh. and look for is there is infiltration with azithals. Because you could know, is this a TH1, is this neutrophil infiltrated, or is this eosophil infiltrated? It would be okay. give you quite information for a cheap price. Yeah. And if it's, if it's neutrophilic, you know it's inflammatory bacterial. Yeah. And if it's, if it's eosophil, you have to think about possible eosophil fungal rhinosinusitis. Yeah. Yeah. And mm. that would is a very cheap thing on secretions to know what is the concrete cellularity of the secretions. Okay. All right. Well, I didn't do that, but I think it's, it's a good suggestion. I think it's indicated also to check lymph nodules. <laughs> and then it's clear lymph situation. Nodes. Yes. Yeah. Met metastasis. Yeah. Uh, we okay. can exclude it. If yes, I open this area widely and uh, take yeah. biopsy. Okay. Well, examination of the neck was normal. Yeah. I did do a biopsy in the clinic even though it was inflammatory, as so I thought I can get away without causing major bleeding. And, and one of the main reasons for doing that, as Hans Rudy said, is it's good to have a definitive diagnosis before you operate, if you can. But we do have problems with access to theatres in our hospital. And, it, and I could not get him admitted very, very urgently. Therefore, I thought getting a biopsy at least would buy me time of knowing what I was dealing with. But anyway, it came back, it was inconclusive. So um, we've got histology, not, not really um, telling you what's going on. So what do you do next? I think that so the operation is justified for the mm. diagnosis. Yeah. Yes. So I think then mm -hmm. we've got to have an operative plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what would you do? How would you manage it now? I do a complete um, and radical um, ethmoidectomy. On radical? the left side, okay. a complete radical ethmoidectomy. Yes. And to um, remove the um, uh, frontal sinus content. Yeah if it's possible, because uh, uh, just uh, um, close to the eyes, the left eyes, you have a mucosil, and you need to uh, remove this content to, uh, um, to open the mucosil, of course, and uh, uh, to do uh, some uh, um, samples for uh, histologic analysis, fungal analysis, bacteriology yeah. analysis. Yeah. It's very important to uh, the future of the patient and to 
uh, to do the diagnosis, in fact. Yeah, because for the With moment, we don't know what it is. Yeah, we don't know what it is. <laughs> Would you use navigation? Sure. Yeah? Why not? Such case, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you'd go for a, a complete removal with ethmoidectomy and clearance of frontal sinus. Mm -hmm. Plus a draft three. Draft three? Yes. Yeah. I would, I would, I would, um, mm -hmm. draft three. I would have one note. Um, yes. I would definitely, and you, you're okay, if you take a biopsy prior to surgery, you can know if this is a feel infiltrated, and that's the reason why I take also secretions. Yes. Because if I have given antibiotics yeah. and oral steroids, I will alter the cellularity of the operation two weeks or two weeks later. And then when I take things out, I yeah. have altered with steroids, I have altered maybe the diagnosis. Okay. So I will think about that also. All right. Yeah. So when I operated, I found a... Uh, an extensive inflammatory polypoid mass in the left side of the nose with extensive tissue going up into the frontal sinus. I didn't know the histology at this moment in time, um, but I did precisely what you said. I used navigation and I tried to clear it as thoroughly as possible. But technically that wasn't easy because it was inflammatory, there was bleeding, yes. uh, polyps seemed to be attached, so I ended up having to almost put too much pressure on to try and remove things. You couldn't easily distinguish polypoid tissue from inflammatory tissue, and I didn't want to be pulling on things like laminar papyracea or skull base. So, I couldn't clear it all in one go. Um, and the main problem was the frontal sinus. I could not get all of the tissue from the frontal sinus. It was very red, it was attached to things, um, and the whole sinus was completely full of polypoid tissue. How so, uh, what sort of approach did you do? A draft. draft. Well, what? I did a, a, a draft 2B on 2B. that occasion, but, mm -hmm. but I just decided it was too dangerous to proceed and I wasn't achieving mm. anything. Mm. I didn't find mucoseals and infection and fungal disease, uh, so I didn't know what the pathology was, it just seemed very strange. You see, on the CT scan yeah. and the, on the MRI, not the CT scan, it seems that it's more on the middle line Mm -hmm. So I would not expect a uh, unilateral draft <coughs> approach to be adequate. That's what I. Uh, that's why I suggest. No, it was a good suggestion, but, but I'm just telling you the the real world I found myself in. Right. That I could not complete that operation at that time, and I just thought it was getting too dangerous. Better to pull out and to stage it. And it, it was the right decision because when I went back, I had the histology. And the histology was inverted papilloma. But the inflammatory part of the condition had completely resolved. So the second stage of the operation was so much easier. And that was done without bleeding, very controlled. I then did a draft three to complete everything, and I completely cleared the frontal sinus. Um, and there was no other hidden, funny, underlying pathology there. Um, so, and this was the, uh, the post-operative scan of the frontal sinus. Uh, and it's interesting how that nasal, se the sinus septum is almost looks pushed right across to the old. So, so you side. you operated the patient two times. Two times. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's stage surgery. Ben, <laughs> <laughs> I may Answer, make yeah. a comment. I think it, it's a good point when you are trapped as a surgeon in a situation where you feel uncomfortable. It's better to stop, even though, you know, I did not complete my mission. Yes. 
yeah. in order not to take too much risk, you can always stop and go back later. So yeah. I think this is a key yeah. point that, yes. you have, that you told us here. Even yeah. in private practice. Even in private <laughs> practice. <laughs> Was the papilloma, yeah. did you have an idea of the extension on papilloma? Because it learns to be a lesson. Mm. Would you have had more information with, the, with an MRI? Well, for, the extent, a, for the extension of the papilloma. I had the MRI and I couldn't tell from the MRI where the couldn't. origin of the tumour was. But I think now having operated, the frontal sinus was full of papilloma, but the tumour was not arising from the, papillo, from the walls of the frontal sinus. It had gone superiorly and then filled the whole of the frontal sinus. So is the frontal recess, you think? So the frontal was, recess yeah. was the key area to it, yes. Because you don't have, bur you, you have buried it with, with diamond burr, didn't yeah. have it, so you have to follow it very closely now. Yes. I see, that's the message. Yes. And the advantage is that he's yeah. now got a, a nice wide opening, yeah. so I can look inside the frontal sinus when he right. comes back to clinic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it, it was a, an interesting, challenging case that wasn't obvious from the start. I was sure there was going to be something funny, such as a square, uh, an odd say, squamous cell carcinoma, or one of the papillomas that starts to turn nasty on you and then turns yeah. into a what we call a transitional cell carcinoma. Yeah. May, may I be annoying a yeah. moment? For a biopsy, do you ask if there is neutrophilic uh, concentration or there is uh, more like an isofil infiltration, does it matter to you to know that on biopsy for chronic disease yeah, like we, this? We see, we really see very little of the neutrophilic. Um, the pathologists, are, uh, they always comment on the eosinophils and then they always call it allergic. Oh my god, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've given up trying to Once stop that one. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, uh, just a comment. <coughs> when I saw the scan, there was a little bit area of new osteogenesis inside the scan, CD scan. Yeah. Uh, there was an area of new bone formation. And uh, can you, ah, yeah, the, 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 that area where Here. there's some of, uh, yeah, That's right, area yes. of new bone formation. Yeah. Yes. Can you go back one slide now? And there? No, one yeah. slide now. <laughs> Yeah, and this gives almost like, uh, to me, I don't know, maybe I saw it, and I was telling my friends, it's looking like a CCP, convoluted cerebral form appearance to me. And so, it, to me, it looked like an inverted papilloma. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think a preoperative uh, uh, a suspicion of an inverted papilloma could come with these two correlating together. Yes, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the appearances that you get on MRI for inverted papilloma, that it, it can take the form of, of looking a bit like brain. Yeah. yeah. So, good yeah. point. I think they call it salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. Salt and yeah. pepper aspect. May I ask you? Yes, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, pathology diagnosis was uh, detected during surgery, urgently, or later on? Uh, no, after the first operation. Mm -hmm. When I sent After tissue, long time, no yeah. intraoperatively, no intraoperatively, because operative. some of because papillomas can be malignant, ten percent about. I know, so mm -hmm. that means second so stage, little bit risky. <laughs> yes, yeah. Why didn't you per uh, perform uh, intraoperative <laughs> pathology? <laughs> right, that's a good point. Um, as I said before, it is impossible for us to get uh, mm -hmm. instant uh, a frozen section um, or mm -hmm. very very urgent pathology. Mm -hmm. uh, the average, I hate to admit this, but the average time to get a tumor pathology back is around about three weeks now. Um, it, but it, it reflects a lot on our NHS. In our case, situation is similar. That's why I'm asking why. Yeah, we are in similar conditions. Yeah. Um, but if it's a transitional cell carcinoma, he was trapped. A frozen section would not have reassured me because I've been in the situation with squamous cell carcinoma where the pathologist has actually said, no, 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 that's benign. And I said, but it's eroding the skull base and the patient's gone blind. Oh, all right, then we'll call it a carcinoma. <laughs> 
I mean, so, I've got them around my little finger. <laughs> for, first surgery was a wide mm -hmm. morphology, wide biopsy. First stage. Uh, what, yes. It was wide biopsy. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. I have just one comment regarding this case. As, yeah. lo as long as we got the pathology as invertebrate papilloma, uh, so it seems that the incidence of recurrence in such a case is nearly 100%. Why? Because of incomplete removal. Because here we got the pathology by chance, and we do yes. not plan it beforehand. <laughs> uh, we have to back and uh, revise matters returning the site of origin and the, where the papilloma arises from to be able to remove the origin and yeah. to bear the bone underneath and remove all the, the mucosa around because in such a case, we did not yeah. identify the origin and we just removed the polyps and send them for the histopathology. No, but, but I knew the pathology after the first operation. Uh -huh. So when I went the back, second operation. I then could do the targeted surgery mm -hmm. on the tumor base. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that is a really important point for inverted papillomas when you're trying to operate to prevent them from recurring. Otherwise, That's the recurrence point is to bring definitely yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Question? Question? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you look for HPV in inverted papillomas? Do you? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> You're just getting me wound up now, <laughs> Tim. <laughs> I've been asking them to do it for years. And, it, and he says, I'm too busy, we can't do that. Yeah. I used to um, send tissue and put it in a tissue bank so we could do it at a later date. But again, we just haven't got the, the services, the, 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 the because supporters. I have a um, very strange experience I uh -huh. did I I did an HPV test on a patient yes and it came back positive on the in the first uh, occasion and then negative but anyway came back positive and the patient got a divorce oh really <laughs> <laughs> because his wife yes googled it and yes. uh, found out that <laughs> HPV is related <laughs> to sexual activity. <laughs> so the patient got a divorce. And then um, I decided not to send for HPV <laughs> in inverted papillomas. That's why uh, Andrew did not do it. My That's why is, I didn't do it. Yeah. My question is, do we have a good reason to look for HPV in inverted papillomas? Yeah. But everybody... You can you can uncover and see if he has condylomata. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I just divert slightly okay. from the nose, because I um, talked to a colleague who was getting changed in theatre, and he was a urologist, and I said, "So what have you been doing? Oh, a reversal of a vas deferens." I said, "Well, when I was a urologist, they never worked." You know, do you get good results? Yeah, we get really good results. And are you, have you done audits? Yeah, we did the audits. Said, what were the results? Well, 80% of the girls got pregnant after the operation. Said, well, how big an audit are you doing? He said, well, we've been stopped from auditing it now because none of the, none of the pregnancies were by the husband. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it was an uncovering a, a new problem. Anyway, back to the nose. Um, okay. So, a couple of quick cases before we finish. Um, 87 year old. Two years of obstruction, uh, tertiary referrals, so sent by a colleague. Um, she had a watery right eye, which I don't know, you, it might not be relevant in an 87 year old. Um, she'd had a biopsy in a, a, of a, a pale polyp in a nasal cavity in the other hospital, and it came back showing inflammatory tissue. So a normal inflammatory nasal polyp again. Um, so, 
I did some further biopsies um, in the clinic and they were able to say definitely not malignant, but they can't work out what it is. So you'd like a scan? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yes. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> You'll be and impressed. Endoscopy. You'll be impressed. Endoscopy. It is so, really, it is oh. really benign. Oh. <laughs> Hans Rudy knows the answer to that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so here we've got. Uh, well, have you got some pulsation uh, pulsation? During the pulsation during the endoscopy? Uh, Actually, the, it did pulsate a bit, yes. Yeah. The attachment, you have any idea of the attachment? It was in the posterior part of the nasal cavity, so it couldn't, and it, it wasn't an obvious attachment. CSF leak? And there was no CSF leak. No CSF leak. Yeah. No. The, but. This fluid can be. Okay. Well, she didn't have a runny nose. She just had a blocked nose. And I got a real surprise when I saw this, the appearance of this scan. So, so you, you've got um, opacity of, of the whole of the posterior ethmoid, but then the skull base is missing, and that's the sphenoid sinus, or what's yeah. left of it. It looks like a... Like, like and a in effect. Hans Rudy's words, it's benign. Yeah, <laughs> It's expansive. Uh, it's expansive. It expansive. Yeah. And it comes from below because it has got yeah. the funnel shaped uh, mm -hmm. defect you yeah. see in encephalocils. So yeah. MRI. It comes from below. It's like an enormous MRI. Yeah. MRI. Yeah. Yeah. MRI. So we're doing MRI. MRI. Yeah. It looks like a mucosil. Very okay. large one. Okay. So, so there's the MRI scan. So we've got some high signal response here, high signal return. Um, it's mainly centered in the sphenoid sinus. I didn't do an angiogram. But it was pale, so it didn't look like a vascular tumor. <coughs> so, what would you do next? I've had two biopsies, inconclusive but benign. Ask an advisor in my clinic. <laughs> Have you got to two? two? I haven't got any, oh, I, I didn't put any more scans, um, didn't collect any more scans. Um, what's, what's the sign of it? But, what was the? What's the sign of the P2 image in T2, P2 sequence sign? The, yeah, we want to rule out fungal. Right, I thought it might be fungal. Did think it might be fungal. Yeah. She's diabetic? No. And she's not diabetic, no. Very, very fit and healthy for 87. Vision. And? Visual disturbances, nothing. No neurological sign. No neurological signs whatsoever. Vision, absolutely fine. No diplopia. No headache. No headache. <laughs> In fact, you, you kept thinking, is it the right scan? But it was. Yeah, but it was definitely the right scan. So, so we've got to make a decision. Do you do another biopsy or do you go in and try and remove it? Or more aggressive biopsy. More aggressive, all right. More tissue. Yeah. Marsupialization. Okay, marsupialization? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that's what I did that. I got her in and I removed as much as I could in the circumstances. Um, but again, erring on the side of caution. On the local? Oh, no, no, under general. Under general. 
schwana, it wasn't a schwannoma, no. And it was a friable tumour, um, wh which seemed to have a yellowish capsule to it. Um, and there were lots of fragments of dead necrotic bone within the sphenoid. And it wasn't a chordoma. Dermoid cyst. And the teratoma, no. No. But I didn't go for complete removal. I went for a very aggressive biopsy, um, clearing as much as I could, because I had a sphenoid sinus that had no bony walls, with the carotid arteries bouncing away on either side. It came and well away from detachment? It, um, not that easily, no. No. So you know the attachment? So did you found well, it was quite wide, but I did fungal studies, inconclusive, more histology inconclusive. Um, and two months later, I reviewed her, and it had got much better, but there was still residual tumor there. So I then went, uh, uh, I took her to the skull base MDT meeting where it generated a huge amount of discussion. Uh, but we then went on to do further surgery with a, jointly with a neurosurgeon, cleared it as thoroughly as possible, um, and uh, at that time we uncovered the carotids and the dura. Um, if you looked in her sphenoid now, it just looks absolutely healthy and clean, um, no pathology, um, and it was what was termed an inflammatory myofibroblastic tumour. But complete rarity. Have you had experience of that? No? Okay. Liverpool entity. But <laughs> anyway, she, she remains to be asymptomatic and very happy for an 87. Yeah. <laughs> how, how much did I pay them? 15? How much are they making it up? Are they making it up? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew, the panel wants to meet your pathologist. <laughs> <laughs> right. We've got a few minutes left. I've got one more case. Um, and... Uh, I'm going to be really interested to see what Sergei thinks of this one. Doesn't make me look good, so don't, don't get at me after it. <laughs> but it's nasal polyps. Um, and I was sent this from one of my colleagues in another hospital. Difficult case of polyps. Um, and the scans all... all right, it's three years. Of, uh, uh, of sim symptoms, quite a lot of sneezing, I looked in his nose, very severe allergic rhinitis, with polyps in the, well, it's a polypoid left middle meatus, really, uh, or middle turbinate. Um, hardly any view in the right side of the nose, and the septum was deviated right across, so he couldn't breathe through either side of his nose. And it was a polyp case. He didn't have all the classic things that you get, such as asthma and aspirin sensitivity. Um, and this is one of the sets of scans. He's had multiple scans, but I, I've put this up for brevity just to show you the main pathology. And it was thought that this was um, quite runnish sinusitis with polyps with a mucosal. So... Sergey, what would you think of that? Fibrosis uh, tumor? Oh, yes. sorry. Uh, yeah. Any bony tumor, benign, of course. It can be a non major tumor. Yes. Yeah. That was a, a, a fibrosseous lesion yeah. Yeah. with polyps and a bent septum and severe allergic rhinitis. Yeah. So. 
And I went ahead and removed the polyps. Uh, we did septoplasty for access, tried to clear his nose, but at the same time, I was able to take biopsies from that, quite large biopsies. It was cancellous bone. It was quite vascular. It bled quite a lot. Um, and it came back as an ossifying fibroma. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So two pathologies together. But what would you do about it? Andrudi, what would you do with that? Know. Well, I presented the case at Endo Milano. I think we were together. This yeah. also five, these lesions are recommended to, uh, to remove them because they have a tendency to recur. And they are located at the strategical yes. place where mm -hmm. they can cause uh, further symptoms. So I would go for a complete removal of that tumor. Okay. All right. Any alternative? Also spray into the orbit. Yeah. Right. So it's, uh, it's uh, uh, deflecting yes. across into the orbit, isn't it? Any, any alternative views on that? Mm. For, for fighting fibroma, it's a, a, a very aggressive uh, local disease and should yeah. be removed, should be removed. Okay. Fibrosis lesion, like fibrous dysplasia, yeah. is very benign and you can leave it in peace or you can just uh, mm -hmm. remove it partially. If it is ossifying fibroma, we have to remove it completely, okay. hand in hand with the neurosurgeon and or the ophthalmology. And right. definitely yeah. the possibility of a repair is there mm -hmm. if the neuro, the neuro is uh, insulted. Yeah. Well, the, the pathology report said cementifying osseous fibroma, mm. rather than not fibrous locally displays, aggressive as well, yeah. you know. Yeah. This is okay. one of the aggressive. So everyone would go for complete removal? Mm -hmm. Or you yes. can debulk the center, central part mm -hmm. of the tumor. Yeah. Because it is believed that in some tumors, uh, the, the, uh, the center of uh, producing the tumor is in the center. So if yes. you remove the, the center of the tumor, uh, they degrade and then uh, they reduce in size. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't as easy to remove as I thought. Um, it was several years ago when he was referred. I didn't have navigation at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And Doing it endonasally was a, a struggle. There was bleeding. I wasn't happy that I could see everything I needed to see. So we then went on to do a, a transorbital approach with a neurosurgeon. Um, and we addressed this section here. Okay. And even with the neurosurgeon, we stopped before we removed all of it. We did get a CSF leak, I repaired that, but it was just getting too scary to remove the whole thing. Personally, I felt cheated. I thought, I've not done it very well, and what am I going to do next? And so I just kept doing surveillance scans and talking to the patient, saying, what would you like us to do? Well, he's now got a clear nose. There's been, we've left a, a rim in the anterior fossa of this, mm -hmm. but we've taken the main bulk of the tumor away. As you said, the center of it where it can grow. And it's been absolutely stable. It hasn't altered or changed in years. And he's asymptomatic and he's clear. Could would you go on to re remove it, or would you just keep watching? <laughs> well, Who's going to be brave? <laughs> we, we had a very nice session from Storz for through the superior transorbital approach. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you can think about that, but I think I would be really conservative. Yeah, well, I, uh, the, we did the transorbital, yeah. and we struggled with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are always several ways, and by the time you did this, we did not have all the fancy uh, yes, instruments. I know. Maybe I know, yeah. today yes. you yeah. would be able easily yeah. to take it away. It will, it will be a struggle, but it's feasible. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but I you think you're absolutely right yeah. The, yeah. that you know we these things develop. The technology develops. 
but we as surgeons develop as well. Mm -hmm. And what we can do now, 10 years ago, it may have been difficult, either expertise or, mm -hmm. or just from experience or the technology. Yeah, Absolutely. but I felt happy in myself. I hadn't caused any damage and I've treated his symptoms. But I've been very surprised that the scans haven't changed because if you read the books on how these things behave, it's yeah. supposed to grow and it hasn't. No. I think you did a wonderful job. But when, <laughs> Thank when, you. Well, yeah, 10 years ago, a wonderful job. Because when you see now the, the, yeah. the illumination and the special instruments by the approach, yes. you, you didn't have that at the time. That's right. That's right, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That has very precisely taken us to the end of the session. Sure. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'd like to give the panel a great big round of applause for being fantastic. Thank you.